In 2006, the United States Navy made one of the most controversial decisions in modern military aviation. It retired an aircraft that could see enemies more than 200 miles away, track dozens of targets at once, and eliminate multiple threats long before visual contact was ever possible. Even more disturbing, instead of preserving this aircraft or passing it to allies, the U.S. chose to destroy nearly every remaining spare part. This was not the retirement of a relic. It was the deliberate dismantling of a weapon system so powerful that its continued existence posed strategic risks. By the end of this story, you'll understand why the Navy walked away from one of the most capable fighters it ever flew, and why that decision still divides experts today. To understand the F-14D Tomcat, you must return to a time when global war felt not just possible, but imminent. During the height of the Cold War, the Soviet Union developed a doctrine centered on destroying American aircraft carriers before they could influence a conflict. Long-range bombers such as the Tu-22M Backfire, armed with massive anti-ship cruise missiles, were designed to launch coordinated attacks from extreme distances. If even one missile penetrated a carrier's defenses, the consequences could be catastrophic. Existing U.S. Navy fighters simply could not intercept these bombers early enough. The threat was not theoretical, it was calculated, rehearsed, and deeply feared inside the Pentagon. The Navy realized it didn't need a traditional dogfighter, it needed a long-range Guardian, an aircraft capable of detecting threats far beyond the horizon, tracking multiple attackers simultaneously, and eliminating them before they could ever fire. This requirement shaped everything that followed. After the failure of the F-111B program, which proved dangerously unsuitable for carrier operations, Grumman Aerospace proposed something radical, a fighter built entirely around fleet defense with no compromises. What emerged was not elegant, not lightweight, and not forgiving, but it was unmatched. The F-14 Tomcat was born to fight a war that everyone hoped would never happen. One of the Tomcat's most distinctive features was its variable sweep wings, and they were far more than a visual trademark. At low speeds, the wings extended outward, allowing the aircraft to land safely on a pitching carrier deck. At high speeds, they swept back, transforming the Tomcat into a Mach-capable interceptor. This design allowed the F-14 to patrol vast stretches of ocean for hours, silently guarding carrier groups, and then accelerate into combat in seconds. It wasn't built to chase enemies, it was built to control airspace. But the Tomcat was never a one-man machine. Unlike most fighters, it was a two-seat system, operated by a pilot in the front and a radar intercept officer in the rear. While the pilot flew the aircraft through turbulent skies and narrow carrier approaches, the RIO managed the radar, tracked targets, prioritized threats, and coordinated missile engagements. In combat, the F-14 was not a jet, it was a team. This division of labor allowed the Tomcat to dominate beyond visual range combat in a way no single-seat fighter ever could. Despite its revolutionary design, early Tomcats carried a dangerous flaw. 
The TF-30 engines, inherited from the failed F-111B, were notoriously unforgiving. Compressor stalls were common, especially during aggressive maneuvers, and even minor throttle mismanagement could result in loss of control. Many pilots openly admitted that the aircraft demanded constant respect. The Tomcat didn't tolerate carelessness. It rewarded discipline and punished mistakes. Yet even with these risks, it remained irreplaceable because nothing else in the world could do what it did. Everything changed with the arrival of the F-14D Super Tomcat. This was not a routine upgrade. It was the aircraft finally reaching its full potential. The unreliable engines were replaced with powerful General Electric F-108s, eliminating the most dangerous handling issues and dramatically improving performance. The cockpit was modernized with digital avionics and improved situational awareness. At its core was the AN-APG-71 radar, a system capable of tracking two dozen targets at extreme distances while guiding multiple missiles at once. The F-14D became what its designers had always envisioned, a flawless fleet defense interceptor. What truly made the Tomcat terrifying, however, was the weapon it carried. The AAM-54 Phoenix missile was unlike anything before or since. With a range exceeding 100 miles, it allowed the F-14D to engage enemy bombers long before they could threaten the fleet. Even more remarkable, the Tomcat could guide up to six Phoenix missiles simultaneously striking multiple targets in a single engagement. This capability forced adversaries to rethink entire attack strategies. The presence of an F-14 on patrol often meant the difference between escalation and deterrence. There is one operational reality that rarely makes it into popular culture. Imagine a night launch from a carrier deck, the ocean invisible below, the jet accelerating into darkness as the deck drops away. Inside the cockpit, the pilot focuses on keeping the aircraft stable while the RIO watches the radar fill with contacts, some real, some deceptive. Decisions are made in seconds. Targets are classified, prioritized, and locked. This was not cinematic dogfighting. This was strategic defense executed under immense pressure, often without ever seeing the enemy. Although Hollywood immortalized the Tomcat, its real legacy was forged in operational service. F-14S flew combat missions over Libya, Iraq, and the Persian Gulf, enforcing no-fly zones, conducting a reconnaissance, and later adapting to precision strike roles they were never originally designed for. In every mission, the aircraft's presence altered the behavior of adversaries. Its radar reach alone reshaped airspace. Few aircraft in history have projected power without firing a shot the way the Tomcat did. Which raises the question that still haunts naval aviation. If the F-14D was so capable, why was it retired? The answer lies not in performance, but in cost and complexity. The Tomcat required extensive maintenance, specialized crews, and aging airframes demanded increasing support. 
As warfare shifted toward multi-role efficiency and networked operations, the Navy chose the F-A-18 Super Hornet, a platform that was cheaper, simpler, and easier to sustain. It was not more powerful. It was more practical. The decision made logistical sense, but it came at the cost of unmatched long-range dominance. Perhaps the most unsettling chapter of the Tomcat story lies outside the United States. Iran remains the only nation still operating the F-14. Despite decades of sanctions, Iranian Tomcats continue to fly, a testament to the aircraft's durability and strategic value. This reality explains why the U.S. chose to destroy its remaining spare parts. The Tomcat was never just an airplane. It was a system whose power extended far beyond the cockpit. In today's era of stealth fighters and sensor fusion, the F-14D would face undeniable challenges. It was not designed to be invisible nor was it built for modern electronic warfare environments. Yet, in its original mission, long-range interception and fleet defense, it remains one of the most capable fighters ever constructed. The Tomcat was not obsolete. It belonged to a different philosophy, one that valued absolute control of airspace over flexibility. The F-14D Tomcat was not retired because it failed. It was retired because the world changed. It represents an era when aircraft were built with singular purpose, uncompromising design, and overwhelming capability. Even decades after its final flight, the Tomcat remains a benchmark against which modern fighters are measured and a reminder that some machines are too powerful to be replaced easily. So the question remains, did the United States retire the F-14D because it was outdated or because it was simply a weapon from an era that no longer exists?